I remember a time back in the, probably it was the 70s maybe, uh, you had to be 25 years old and have a note from your local sheriff in order to buy a can of spray paint. <laughs> now I know why. <laughs> I was worried about being uptight about this. <laughs> okay, this is the after lunch hour, so everybody's full and it's dark, so just as long as your snoring doesn't interrupt, we'll be good. 3D print your village home. Anybody ever heard anything that, quite that strange? I want to tell you that high tech is appropriate technology. A man's home is his castle. A woman's home is, well, <laughs> palace. Be it ever so humble, there is no place like home. Unfortunately, some humble homes are just a little too humble. About 1.6 billion people around the world live in substandard housing. Another 100 million are homeless. I'm going to talk about the difference between shelter and ambiance. Mr. and Ms. Caveman are sitting there in the cave on their nice contoured rocks, leaning on a nice flat top boulder. Mrs. Caveman looks at him and says, the kitchen's a little small but I really like the granite countertops. <laughs> the cave is shelter, the granite countertops are ambiance. Now shelter, we want to make shelter that can be passed down from generation to generation. Your children, your grandchildren, your grandchildren's grandchildren can use the shelter function of what I'm going to talk about. Each generation changes the ambiance. Customize it for their own need. Uh, most places, the ambiance portion of a house is about half the cost. So, how do we lower the cost of shelter to help meet the need, meet the needs of these 1.6 billion people? We're going to use a thing called an echo shell. Echo shells were developed by David South of Monolithic Domes, and uh, they've kind of taken on around the world. This is one in a little village of Chinook, Belize. It's a magic. It's tiny outside. But if you go through that door and look east, you've got a lot of room. And you go to the other side and turn around, and there's a lot of room. This is a 20-foot echo shell dome, which the United Nations says is uh, adequate for a family of eight in the developing world. A lot of room in there. These, another way to lower the cost is to build stronger, longer lasting structures. Make the basic structure last for 100, 200 years. Make a structure that will stand up under hurricanes and tornadoes, earthquakes, and brush fires. And how do we do it? We do it, we can build homes from this, we can use this technology to build schools, we can build churches, Built a lot of things. This is a home in Indonesian village, the village that was wiped out by a landslide. This is in Sri Lanka. This is an area that was hit by the tsunami in, in Christmas of 04. This is another home. This is a community out in South Texas, replacing trailer parks. The utility costs on these are about uh, one quarter to one half of a conventional home. This is that whole village in Indonesia. You can do this for churches. This is a small mosque that's part of that village. Or you can make a larger church with the domes. This is a school that's going up in Haiti. Uh, uh, Heroes for Haiti is building. This is a 40-foot echo shell dome. You can put a window air conditioner on it, attach a little cool bottle electronic device, and you can turn this 20-foot dome with a little bit of insulation on it into a walk-in cooler. I've got friends in a village on the southern coast of Haiti that need a way to keep their fishing catch cool in order to get it to market without, uh, without it spoiling. You can build these echo shells up to 50 feet in diameter. If you insulate uh, the form that I'll be showing you in a minute, uh, it gives a little extra strength, and you can build these up to 300 feet in diameter. 
Conventional buildings take about two to three times the concrete that an echo shell needs. They take three to four times the amount of reinforcing steel. And it takes double the labor to build a conventional home over an echo shell dome. Now, is anybody doing anything else with 3D printing buildings? Southern California, University of Southern California, Dr. Kushnevnis, and forgive me, sir, for mispronouncing your name, uh, has got a Cartesian 3D printer. It's really fancy. It is very versatile. You can print all sorts of things with it. But it's got a drawback that we'll look at later. MIT has a building scale 3D printing. And they use a robotic arm similar to this. And that's headed up by Drs. Uh, Oxnum and uh, Dr. Keaton. So how is my idea different? I cheat. I told you I was going to do 3D printing. Now, let's get rid of one dimension. Let's print a three-dimensional object using two dimensions. We go back to Einstein. We curve space. I haven't got time to curve yet. Otherwise, I could get done quicker. But we're going to do two-dimensional printing. And we do that with a three-dimensional printer, but we only utilize two of the dimensions. The way we do it, we, we use a thing called an airform. An airform is the paper we print upon. But instead of printing it flat, it's going to be dome-shaped. And when we print, we're only going to be concerned with how far around, we go, the, uh, around the dome we go, the azimuth, and how far up the dome we go, the elevation. Those are our two dimensions. The thickness, the up and down on other printers, is taken care of by the airform. That's an airform. It's a nylon bag covered with vinyl. We blow it up. There are two nice things about it. It's relatively affordable, but most of all, it's reusable. You can do 100, sometimes 200 buildings with one airform. After you get it all inflated, you bring the family outside, the future residents, and everybody smiles and poses for the group picture, except for the little kid on the end, and he had his eyes closed, I think. Now, we've got to get up on this air form to work. If you're here in the States or a developing country, you go down and you can rent a, uh, a boom truck. Makes it real easy. Gets you right up on top of it. You don't have that luxury in the developing world. You have locally made scaffolding, bamboo, sticks, whatever's available. Sometimes precarious, sometimes dangerous. All the time, you're putting weight on that airform, which will hold you, but you're also putting the weight on the fresh concrete we've just applied. So what do we do different? We're going to use a polar scaffold. This is one specially imported from Eskimo country. No, actually, polar as in polar axis. And the wheels on the bus go round and round. Actually, the scaffold doesn't rotate quite this fast. The track moves about three feet at a time. The little green box you see at the bottom is the print head. It works its way up the ladder, depositing concrete as it goes. When it does a strip, it'll sidestep and do the next strip, and then the next strip. If we need to, we can put a print head on each of those ladders, and we can put more ladders if we want to. If you get some old redneck putting your concrete on, it's going to go real slow. So get somebody that knows what they're doing. You work faster with the right music, and this guy is real good at it. Put it on with a, uh, with a hawk and a trowel. That's one way to get concrete on. Another way is to use <coughs> A uh, shotcrete gun. As you can see, it really throws that concrete. Only problem is the gun, the compressor, and everything goes with it is about $30,000. So here's a poor man's shotcrete. This is our fellow with the trowel, and uh, he saw this and he got so excited. This whole rig compressor, the mortar sprayer, the hose is, is about $2,000 instead of $30,000. Not quite as fast as shot creep, but good enough for us. Okay, a 3D printer needs a print head. You're going to like this. Is that one strange looking print head? That's my R&D prototype. 
The objective is to extrude a ribbon of concrete half inch to three quarters of an inch thick. And in this case, it's about 12 inches wide. When we get to production, we'll go and aim it to three or four feet. This takes care of that third axis. Think of decorating a cake. You've got all the icing in the bag and you're squeezing it out. You've got that little flat nozzle that gives you the fancy ribbons. We don't want the fancy ribbons. We just want it flat. And we do it this way. We've got a print head, now we need a pump. Conventional pumps are quite expensive. In the developing world, we're gonna be using a hand diaphragm pump. And there's a whole rig. He wasn't very good at putting concrete on fast, so we had him do the model to show everything. The blue drum will have the lid cut off, and that uh, the side cut off, and that'll be the hopper for the concrete. And pump it out, pump it up to that print head. The other big change we're going to do is get rid of the steel and use basalt reinforcement. What is basalt? Anybody know? Lava. Lava rock. Everywhere. You heat it up, put it through little uh, nozzles, and it makes a type of fiberglass, but it's cheaper than the sand you have to use for fiberglass, and it's more resistant to the alkaline. It's one-ninth the weight of steel, and it does not corrode. That's the big thing. If you've ever lived up north, see where the ice uh, salt the roads, and you see what the concrete does when it gets salt on it. The steel corrodes, expands, and blows the concrete away. It's lightweight, it's a moderate price, and that's what it looks like. It's about an eighth of an inch wide, and we put these ropes as reinforcement between the first and second layer of concrete on eight inch on center. That's a 10 kilo spool of basalt. Two of those is more than enough to do a 20-foot dome. Three will do a, a 30-foot. So, how else is my idea different? Well, talk to you about Dr. Schnevnitz at, at Southern Cal. His machine will cost between $500,000 and $700,000. MIT, they said, we don't focus only on efficiency translations. MIT is looking at the pure research aspect and the design. My idea is different because I want to make it affordable for local builders around the world. Why? We get that same old fat redneck and get out in his backyard and a couple of hand tools and make it in his backyard. The total equipment package is only about 5% of the cost of these other units. About the cost of a new basic pickup, not your fancy one with the chrome and everything else, basic pickup for all the equipment, concrete mixer included. The other thing is it's gonna be open source. We all know the benefits of open source. Put a lot of minds, a lot of eyes, a lot of hands working on a problem and they'll come up with better solutions than I'm presenting to you here today. But plant the seed. So, where do we go from here? Yeah, if you've wondered about this, you didn't know you were starting in Hickory, but you're really in Hyde Park. <laughs> All right, here goes. 1.6 billion people need better housing, right? Huge number. Possible? Well, we all studied Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. Down on the bottom of that was food, water, shelter. Let's look what's been done with these three things. Food, back in 1968, a guy named Paul Ehrlich published a book called Population Bomb. He said the battle to feed humanity is over. He said India in particular will not be able to feed another 200 million people by the year 1980. He didn't count on men like Norman Borla. Norman Borla is the father of the Green Revolution. His idea was simple. Make developing countries self-sufficient in food by teaching them how to use modern agricultural techniques that are simple to implement. Did he make a difference? Yes. By 2000, India's population had doubled, but its wheat production had trebled, and its economic productivity had gone up nine times. Water, 1990, excuse me, 1988, a young man in Kenya 
was taught how to drill water wells for families using hand tools, and then how to make a simple hand pump and install it. Did it work? This is what he learned to do. Pure, clean water coming out of your backyard on your farm. By 1996, he had completed 260 wells. Many of them were serving three to 10 families. The initial capital cost for all his equipment to do these wells was less than $500 in today's dollars, today's prices. Average cost to drill the well and install the pump was $150. So what can we, you and you and you, and I do to help meet the need these 1.6 billion people have for decent housing. Teach a man to build better, more affordable housing. We saw how teaching better farming, teaching to do a well, teaching to build better housing. Teach a man to fish. You know, Mike said this morning, you can be a superhero, but if you don't pass it on to somebody else, you're a super zero. Teach a man to fish. This is what we can do. The world's most famous commercial fisherman, he used to catch tilapia on the lowest freshwater lake in the world. A guy named Simon Peter. He said, serve one another with the particular gifts God has given each of you as faithful dispensers of the magnificently varied grace of God. Thank you.